Finney's Lectures on Systematic Theology Moral Government Lecture 1 1. Definition of Law 2. Distinction between Physical and Moral Law 3. Attributes of Moral Law So, Moral Government 1. All right, the definition. In discussing the subject, I must begin with defining the term law. Law in a sense of the term both sufficiently popular and scientific for my purpose, is a rule of action. In its generic signification, it is applicable to every kind of action, whether of matter or of mind, whether intelligent or unintelligent, whether free or necessary action. Two. I must distinguish between physical and moral law. Physical law is a term that represents the order of sequence in all the changes that occur under the law of necessity, whether in matter or mind. I mean all changes, whether of state or action, that do not consist in the voluntary states or actions of free will. Physical law is the law of force, or necessity, as opposed to the law of liberty. Physical law is the law of the material universe. It is also the law of mind. So far as its states and changes, so far as its states and changes are involuntary, all changes of mental state or action which do not consist in free and sovereign changes or actions of will must occur under and be subject to physical law. They cannot possibly be accounted for except as they are ascribed to the law of necessity or force. In one word then, physical law is the law of necessity or force and controls all changes in actions, whether of matter or mind, except the actions of free will. Okay, that was physical law. Now, moral law is a rule of moral action with sanctions. It is that rule of action to which moral beings are under a moral obligation to conform all their voluntary actions, and is enforced by sanctions equal to the value of the precept. It is the rule for the government of free and intelligent action, as opposed to necessary and unintelligent action. It is the law of liberty, as opposed to the law of necessity, of motive, and free choice, as opposed to force, force of every kind that renders action necessary or unavoidable. Moral law is a rule for the direction of the action of free will, and strictly of free will only. But less strictly, it is the rule for the direction of the actions of free will, and of all those actions and states of mind and body that are connected with the free actions of will by a physical law, or by a law of necessity, Thus, moral law controls involuntary mental states and outward action only by securing conformity of the actions of free will to its precept. 3. I must point out the essential attributes of moral law. 1. Subjectively. Subjectively. It is and must be an idea of the reason developed in the mind of the subject. It is an idea or conception of that state of will or course of action which is obligatory upon a moral agent. No one can be a moral agent or the subject of moral law unless he has this idea developed, for this idea is identical with the law. It is the law developed or revealed within himself, and thus he becomes a law to himself. 
his own reason affirming his obligation to conform this idea to this idea or law. To a second attribute is liberty as opposed to necessity. It is its precept must lie developed in the reason as a rule of duty, a law of moral obligation, a rule of choice, or of ultimate intention, declaring that which a moral agent ought to choose, will, intend. But it does not, must not, cannot possess the attribute of necessity in its relations to the actions of free will. It must not, cannot, possess an element or attribute of force in any such sense as to render conformity of will to its precept unavoidable and necessary. This would confound it with physical law. 3. A third attribute of moral law is adaptability or adaption. It must be the law of nature. That is, its precept must prescribe and require just that state of the will and that course of action which is demanded by the nature and relations of moral beings and nothing more or less. Moral law, subjectively considered, is simply an idea of that state of the voluntary power that is befitting to moral agents upon condition of their nature and relations. Their nature and relations being perceived, the reason hereupon necessarily affirms that they ought to will, intend, the highest good of being for its own intrinsic value. This is what, it's, this is what is meant by the law of nature. It is a law or rule necessarily imposed upon us by our own nature. It is nothing more or less than that which reason spontaneously and necessarily affirms to be fit, proper, right in view of our nature and relations and the intrinsic value of the highest well-being of God and the universe. Those being given... This is affirmed to be duty. It is an idea of that state of the heart and that course of life that from their nature and relations is indispensable to the highest good of all. By moral law being the law of nature is intended that the nature and relations of moral agents being what they are a certain course of willing and acting is indispensable to and will result in their highest well-being, that their highest well-being is valuable in itself and should be willed for that reason. 4. A fourth attribute of moral law is universality. The conditions being the same, it requires and must require of all moral agents, the same things in whatever world they may be found. 5. A fifth attribute of moral law is uniformity. All the conditions and circumstances, all the conditions and circumstances being the same, its claims are uniformly the same. This follows from the very nature of moral law. 6. A sixth attribute of moral law is and must be impartiality. Moral law is no respecter of persons, knows no privileged classes. It demands one thing of all, without regard to anything except the fact that they are moral agents. By this it is not intended that the same course of outward conduct is required of all, but the same state of heart in all. 
that all shall have one ultimate intention, that all shall consecrate themselves to one end, that all shall entirely conform in heart and life to their nature and relations. 7. A seventh attribute of moral law is and must be justice. That which is unjust cannot be law. Justice, as an attribute of moral law, must respect both the precept and the sanction. Justice, as an attribute of the precept, consists in the requisition of just that, and no more, which is in exact accordance with the nature and relations of the subject. Justice, as an attribute of the sanction, consists in the promise of just such rewards and punishments as are equal to the guilt of disobedience, on the one hand, and to the value of obedience, on the other. Sanctions belong to the very essence and nature of moral law. A law without sanctions is no law. It is only counsel or advice. Sanctions are, in a certain sense, to be explained in a future lecture. The motives which the law presents with design to secure obedience to the precept. Consequently, they should always be graduated by the importance of the precept, and that is not properly law which does not promise, expressly or impliedly, a reward proportionate to the value of obedience, and threaten punishment equal to the evil or guilt of disobedience. Law cannot be unjust, either in precept or sanction, and it should always be remembered that what is unjust is not law, cannot be law. It is contrary to the true definition of law. Moral law is a rule of action, founded in and suited to the nature and relations of moral beings sustained by sanctions equal to the value of obedience and the guilt of disobedience. 8. An eighth attribute of moral law is practicability. That which the precept demands must be possible to the subject. That which demands a natural impossibility is not and cannot be moral law. The true definition of law excludes the supposition that it can, under any circumstances, demand an absolute impossibility. Such a demand could not be in accordance with the nature and relations of moral agents, and therefore practicability must always be an attribute of moral law. To talk of inability to obey moral laws, to, to talk of inability to obey moral law is to talk sheer nonsense. A ninth attribute of moral law is independence. It is founded in the self-existent nature of God. It is an eternal and necessary idea of the divine reason. It is the unalterable and external self-existent rule of the divine conduct, the law which the intelligence of God imposes on himself. He is a law to himself. Moral law, as we shall see hereafter more fully, does not and cannot originate in the will of God. It originates, or rather, is founded in his eternal, immu immutable, self-existent nature. It eternally existed in the divine reason. It is the idea of that state of will which is obligatory upon God upon condition of his natural attributes, or in other words, upon condition of his nature. As a law, it is entirely independent of his will, 
just as his own existence is. It is obligatory also upon every moral agent, entirely independent of the will of God, their nature and relations being given, and their intelligence being developed, moral law must be obligatory upon them, and it lies not in the option of any being to make it otherwise, to pursue a course of conduct suited to their nature and relations is necessarily and self-evidently obligatory. The willing or nilling of any being to the contrary notwithstanding. 10. A tenth attribute of moral law is immutability. Moral law can never change or be changed. Moral law always requires of every moral agent a state of heart and course of conduct precisely suited to his nature and relations. Nothing more nor less. Whatever his nature is, his capacity and relations are, entire conformity to just that nature. Those capacities and relations is required at every moment and nothing more or less. If capacity is enlarged, the subject is not thereby rendered capable of works, of supererogation, of doing more than the law demands. Supererogation, doing more than the law demands. For the law still, as always, requires the full consecration of his whole being to the public interest. If by any means whatever his ability is abridged, moral law, always and necessarily consistent with itself, still requires that what is left, nothing more or less, shall be consecrated to the same end as before. Whatever demands more or less than entire, universal, and constant conformity of heart and life to the nature, capacity, and relations of moral agents, be they, be what, be they what they may, is not and cannot be moral law. Okay, whatever demands more or less than entire, universal, and constant conformity of heart and life to the nature, capacity, and relations of moral agents, be they what they may, is not and cannot be moral law. To suppose that it could be otherwise would be to contradict the true definition of moral law. If therefore the capacity is by any means abridged, the subject does not thereby become incapable of rendering full obedience for the law still demands and urges that the heart and life shall be fully conformed to the present existing nature, capacity, and relations. Anything that requires more or less than this, whatever else it is, is not and cannot be moral law. To affirm that it can is to talk nonsense. Nay, it is to blaspheme against the immaculate majesty of moral law. Moral law invariably holds one language. It never changes the spirit of its requirement. Thou shalt love. Or be perfectly benevolent. Is its uniform and its only demand. This demand, it never varies and never can vary. It is as immutable as God is, and for the same reason. To talk of letting down or altering moral law is to talk absurdly. The thing is naturally impossible. No being has the right or the power to do so. The supposition overlooks the very nature of moral law. Should the natural capability of the mind, by any means whatever, be enlarged or abridged, it is perfectly absurd and a contradiction of the nature 
of moral law to say that the claims of the law are either elevated or lowered. Moral law is not a statute, an enactment, that has its origin or its foundation in the will of any being. It is the law of nature, the law which the nature or constitution of every moral agent imposes on himself. It is the unalterable demand of the reason that the whole being, whatever there is of it at any time, shall be entirely consecrated to the highest good of universal being. In other words, it is the soul's idea or conception of that state of heart and course of life which is exactly suited to its nature and relations. It cannot be too distinctly understood that moral law is nothing more or less than the law of nature. That is, it is the rule imposed on us, not by the arbitrary will of any being, but by our own intelligence. It is an idea of that which is fit, suitable, agreeable to our nature and relations for the time being. That which it is reasonable for us to will and do at any and every moment in view of all the circumstances of our present existence. Just what the reason affirms to be suited to our nature and relations under all the circumstances of the case. It has been said that if we dwarf or abridge our powers, we do not thereby abridge the claims of God, that if we render it impossible to perform so high a service as we might have done, the lawgiver nevertheless requires the same as before, that is, that under such circumstances he requires of us an impossibility, that should we dwarf or completely derange or stultify, stultify our powers, he would still hold us under obligation to perform all that we might have performed, had our powers remained in their integrity. To this I reply that this affirmation assumes that moral law and moral obligation are founded in the will of God, that is, mere will makes law. This is a fundamental mistake. God cannot legislate in the sense of making law. He declares and enforces the common law of the universe or in other words, the law of nature. This law, I repeat it, is nothing else than that rule or of conduct which is in accordance with the nature and relations of moral beings. The totality of its requisitions are, both in its letter and its spirit, thou shalt love with all thy heart, thy soul, thy might, thy strength. That is, whatever there is of us at any moment is to be wholly consecrated to God and the good of being and nothing more or less. If our nature or relations are changed, no matter by what means or to what extent, provided we are still moral agents, its language and spirit are the same as before. Thou shalt love with all thy strength, and so on. I will here quote from the Oberlin Evangelist, an extract of a letter from an esteemed brother embodying the substance of the above objection together with my reply. One point is what you say of the claims of the law. 
in the Oberlin Evangelist, Volume 2, page 50. The question is, what does the law of God require of Christians of the present generation in all respects in our circumstances, with all the ignorance and debility of body and mind which have resulted from the intemperance and abuse of the human constitution through so many generations? But if this be so, then the more ignorant and debilitated a person is in body and mind, in consequence of his own or ancestors' sins and follies, the less the law would require of him, and the less would it be for him to become perfectly holy. And the nearer this ignorance and debility came to being perfect, the nearer would be would he be to being perfectly holy, for the less would be required of him to make him so. But is this so? Can a person be perfectly sanctified, while particularly that ignorance of mind, which is the effect of the intemperance and abuse of the human constitution, remains? Yea, can he be sanctified at all? Only as this ignorance is removed by the truth and spirit of God, it being a moral and not a physical effect of sinning. I say it kindly. Here appears to me at least a very serious entering wedge of error. Were the effect of human depravity upon man simply to disable him, like taking from the body a limb, or destroying in part or in whole a faculty of the mind, I would not object. But to say this effect is ignorance, a moral effect wholly, and then say having this ignorance, the law levels its claims according to it, and that with it a man can be entirely sanctified looks not to me like the teachings of the Bible. One, I have seen the passage from my lecture, here alluded to, quoted and commented upon in different periodicals and uniformly with entire disapprobation. Two, it has always been separated entirely from the exposition which I have given of the law of God in the same lectures, with which exposition no one, so far as I know, has seen fit to grapple. 3. I believe in every instance the objections that have been made to this paragraph were made by those who profess to believe in the present natural ability of sinners to do all their duties. To do all their duty. Four, I would, I would most earnestly and respectfully inquire what consistency there is in denominating this paragraph a dangerous heresy and still maintaining that men are at present naturally able to do all that God requires of them. I would most earnestly and respectfully inquire what consistency there is in denominating this paragraph a dangerous heresy and still maintaining that men are present, naturally able to do all that God requires of them. Five, I put the inquiry back to those brethren. By what authority do you affirm that God requires any more of any moral agent in the universe and of man in his present condition than he is at present able to perform. 6. I inquire, does not the very language of the law of God prove to a demonstration that God requires no more of man than, in his present state, he is able to perform? Let us hear its language. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, 
and with all thy strength thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now here God so completely levels his claim by the very wording of these commandments to the present capacity of every human being. However young or old, however maimed, debilitated, or idiotic as to use the language or sentiment of Professor Hickok of Auburn Seminary, uttered in my hearing that, if it were possible to conceive of a moral pygmy, the law requires of him nothing more than to use whatever strength he has in the service and for the glory of God. Thy strength. All right, number seven. I most respectfully but earnestly inquire of my brethren if they believe that God requires as much of men as of angels, of a child as a man, of a half-idiot as of a Newton, probably Isaac Newton. I mean not to ask whether God requires an equally perfect consecration of all the powers actually possessed by each of these classes, but whether in degree he really requires the same, irrespective of their present natural ability. Number eight, I wish to inquire whether my brethren do not admit that the brain is the organ of the mind and that every abuse of the physical system has abridged the capacity of the mind while it remains connected with this tenement of clay. And I would also ask whether my brethren mean to maintain, at the same breath, the doctrine of present natural ability to comply with all the requirements of God, and also the fact that God now requires of man just the same degree of service that he might have rendered if he had never sinned, or in any way violated the laws of his being. And if they maintain these two positions at the same time, let's see, what is this? The doctrine of present to comply with all the requirements of God, and also the fact that God now requires a man just the same degree of service that he might have rendered if he had never sinned, or in any way violated the laws of his being. And if they maintain these positions, these two positions at the same time, I father inquire whether they believe that man has natural ability at the present moment to bring all his faculties and powers together with his knowledge onto as high ground and into the same state in which they might have been, had he never sinned. My brethren, is there not some inconsistency here? Nine. In the paragraph from the letter above quoted, the brother admits that if a man by his own act had deprived himself of any of his corporal faculties, he would not thenceforth be under an obligation to use those faculties. But he thinks this principle does not hold true in respect to the ignorance of man, because he esteems his ignorance a moral and not a natural defect. Here I beg leave to make a few inquiries. 1. Should a man wickedly deprive himself of the use of a hand, would not this act be a moral act? No doubt it would. 2. Suppose a man by his own act should make himself an idiot, would not this act be a moral act? 3. Would he not in both these cases render himself naturally unable, in the one case, to use his hand, and in the other his reason? Undoubtedly he would. But how can it be affirmed with any show of reason that in the one case his natural inability discharges him from the obligation to use his hand? and that in the other case his natural ability does not affect his obligation, that he is still bound to use his reason, of which he has voluntarily deprived himself, but not his hand. Now the fact is 
that in both these cases the inability is a natural one. 4. I ask, if a man has willingly remained in ignorance of God, whether his ignorance is a moral or natural inability, if it is a moral inability, he can instantly overcome it by the right exercise of his own will. And nothing can be a moral inability that cannot be instantaneously removed by our own volition. Do my brethren believe that the present ignorance of mankind can be instantaneously removed and their knowledge become as perfect as it might have been had they never sinned by an act of volition on the part of men? If they do not, why do they call this a moral inability? Or ignorance a moral effect? The fact is that ignorance is often the natural effect of moral delinquency. Neglect of duty occasions ignorance, and this ignorance constitutes a natural inability to do that of which a man is utterly ignorant. Just as the loss of a hand, in the case supposed, is the natural effect of a moral act, but in itself constitutes a natural inability to perform those duties that might have been performed but for the loss of, his, of this hand. The truth is that this ignorance does, does constitute, while it remains, a natural inability to perform those duties of which the mind is ignorant. And all that can be required is that from the present moment the mind should be diligently and perfectly engaged in acquiring what knowledge it can and in perfectly obeying as fast as it can obtain the light. Obeying as fast as it can obtain the light. If this is not true, it is utter nonsense to talk about natural ability as being a sine qua non of moral obligation. And I would kindly but most earnestly ask my brethren by what rule of consistency they maintain at the same breath the doctrine of a natural ability to do whatever God requires and also insist that he requires men to know as much and in all respects to render him the same kind and degree of service as if they never had sinned or rendered themselves in any respect naturally incapable of doing and being. At the present moment, all that they might have done and been, had they never in any instance neglected their duty. Ten. The brother in the above paragraph seems to feel pressed with the consideration that if it be true that a man's ignorance can be any excuse for his not at present doing what he might have done, but for this ignorance, it will follow that the less he knows, the less is required of him. And should he become a perfect idiot, he would be entirely discharged from moral obligation. To this I answer, yes, or the doctrine of natural ability and the entire government of God are a mere farce. If a man should annihilate himself, would he not thereby set aside his moral obligation to obey God? Yes, truly. Should he make himself an idiot, has he not thereby annihilated his moral agency? And of course his natural ability to obey God. And will my new school brethren adopt the position of Dr. Wilson of Cincinnati as maintained on the trial of Dr. Beecher that moral obligation does not imply ability of any kind? The truth is that for the time being, a man may destroy his moral agency by rendering himself a lunatic or an idiot, 
And while this lunacy or idiocy continues, obedience to God is naturally impossible and therefore not required. But it is also true that no human being and no moral agent can deprive himself of reason and moral agency but for a limited time. There is no reason to believe that the soul can be deranged or idiotic when separated from the body, and therefore moral agency will in all cases be renewed in a future, if not in the present state of existence, when God will hold men fully responsible for having deprived themselves of power to render him all that service which they might otherwise have rendered. But do let me inquire again. Can my dear brethren maintain that an idiot or lunatic can be a moral agent? Can they maintain that a moral being is the subject of moral obligation any farther than he is in a state of sanity? Can they maintain that an infant is the subject of moral obligation previous to all knowledge? And can they maintain that moral obligation can, in any case, exceed knowledge? If they can and do, then, to be consistent, they must flatly deny that natural ability is a sine qua non of moral obligation and adopt the absurd dogma of Dr. Wilson that moral obligation does not imply any ability whatever. When my brethren will take this ground, I shall then understand and know where to meet them. But I beseech you, brethren, not to complain of inconsistency in me, nor accuse me of teaching dangerous heresy, while I teach nothing more than you must admit to be true, or unequivocally admit, in extenso, the very dogma of Dr. Wilson quoted above. I wish to be distinctly understood. I maintain that present ignorance is present natural inability as absolutely as the present want of a hand is present natural inability to use it. And I also maintain that the law of God requires nothing more of any human being than that which he is at present naturally able to perform under the present circumstances of his being. Do my brethren deny this? If they do, then they have gone back to Dr. Wilson's ground. If they do not, why am I accounted a heretic by them for teaching what they themselves maintain? 11. In my treatise upon the subject of entire sanctification, I have shown from the Bible that actual knowledge is indispensable to moral obligation and that the legal maxim, ignorance of the law excuses no one, is not good in morals. 12. 